Hello and welcome to the SNOMED CT drug extension model tutorial. Um, your tutors for this morning are Linda Bird and Alejandro, and I'm not going to try and say your last name, <laughs> from um, the implementation support team uh, and myself, Julie, who um, I'm sure um, many of you have met. We have an awful lot of slides this morning. So um, some things we will just rush through. I guess some people here are really familiar with the model. Um, others of you, this is in a sense brand new. Uh, the slides I'm sure are available once we've finished. Um, and there's a lot of content. So please feel free to go uh, to back and look. Um, so these are the areas that we want to cover. We have to cover the international model as well as the national, because these are so interlinked. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the practicalities and um, some of the things around querying and actually using this content. So I'm going to make a start with just a very short um, focus at why. So often we need to know our use cases to know why we're bothering with time and effort. Um, you know, I, I introduce myself as I'm Julie, I do drugs. Drugs are the most common healthcare intervention. Within minutes of being born, babies, are, you dribble in some vitamin K, you know, before they're three months old, we've vaccinated them with, I don't know, about 10 different antigens, poor little things. We all receive medications. Even if you're going for surgery, you'll have your pre-op, you'll have your post-op, you'll have your anesthesia, you'll have your antibiotics. This is, you know, drugs are the linchpin of, of modern healthcare. Um, and if SNOMED claim is the most comprehensive clinical terminology, then surely we need to be incorporating those things that are the most common. And also, we're not just here for direct patient care, care. We are here for clinical research. We're really interested in improving the health of future patients and populations. Now, not all clinical terminologies include medicinal products. ICD-10 doesn't. MEDRA, the big re clinical research terminology, doesn't. Um, why? Why not? Well, <laughs> medicines are a bit odd in that they're, they're highly controlled because they can be quite dangerous as well as very ben beneficial. And that control is quite regional. Um, we tend to think of it as national, but actually it can even be sub-national um, in, in regional. And therefore, it's really challenging to have a terminology that is globally appropriate. And if you think of a myocardial infarction, it doesn't matter where we are in the world. It's about um, a block of one of your cardiac arteries and we all know what it means. That's not necessarily true with the brand name of a medicine. It could actually mean two completely different things. Um, one of the websites, uh, say patient safety websites has a whole list of those. So um, it is hard to have that thing that is globally appropriate, but SNOMED CT accepts that challenge. Within that challenge, we have a set of use cases that we try and cover internationally. And that in a sense sets our scope and helps us to manage that challenge without getting too tied up into it. And I'm just going to run through this very quickly. All of these are listed out in the documentation about the model. Um, we are there to provide concepts to support other parts of SNOMED. That isn't necessarily perfect at the moment, but something we're working on more and more. If you were around the expo last year, you will have seen a primarily Linda's presentation, although Tony and I um, helped with that. 
about Pierre and how he travels from one country to another and this idea of international interoperability of medication concepts in a sense the core of all of that which we do and I'm getting slightly confused with this clicker going backwards and forwards um, I've talked about uh, the importance of clinical research you will hear in this presentation the difference between the open world and the closed world view of medications and mostly when we're talking about patient care it's the closed world view but we have the open world view and that is really important for clinical research. Um, we're working in one of the European projects with the pharmacovigilance people and they go, oh, open world concepts where we've got a little bit of, not ambiguity, but a little bit more scope than what we've got, for example, in IDMP, PHP IDs. Oh, that could be really useful. Um, and we're around supporting international de uh, clinical decision support. This is a really busy slide that we absolutely haven't got, got time to go through. But what it talks about is how if a patient has an allergy to saponamide recorded in their EHR, that because of the relationships between the medications, something is prescribed, the relationships are there to make uh, the allergy alert work. And, we have the allergy subgroup in SNOMED CT. So, and, and finally, I think almost finally, in the global stage where our regulators are beginning to come together, we need to be compatible with this international IDMP model uh, and particularly to avoid clashes of understanding uh, because if we have those, that interoperability becomes harder and harder. And um, finally, I think, because um, you don't get the where, where next slides up here, in a sense, the focus of what we're talking about today, we are providing the foundation for the national medicinal product terminology for consistent and usable concepts. And as I will keep saying and saying, we are the one area where there is this enormous interdependency between the national and the international at modeling at attributes. Um, and we have the classifier to, to help us with, with all of that and to maintain it. And so when you author things in the national, if you are using that way, and um, there are other ways of using uh, SNOMED CT, and we've talked about this in the, the drug user group with mapping and so forth. Um, we have the, the MRCM and all the attributes to make things machine processable. So that was my very fast introduction. Okay, hi everyone. I'm going to give you a hopefully a brief introduction to the SNOMED international drug model, because as Julie said, this is an important foundation for understanding the drug extension model. This is, provides the basis. So what we're talking about here are the concepts that live inside the pharmaceutical biologic product hierarchy. And if we look inside there, it's actually inside the medication product um, sub hierarchy of that. So that's the sub hierarchy that we'll be talking about. Now, later we'll also be talking about the sub hierarchy below it, the medicinal product package model, but only extension concepts live under that one. So we're going to start with the medicinal product sub hierarchy. And the SNOMED CT medicinal product hierarchy provides concepts that represent medicinal products at various levels of abstractions with international applicability and support for interoperability in patient care and health data analysis. They provide a foundation from which member nations can extend with additional concepts suitable for their own healthcare culture and practice or to which existing terminology can be mapped. Um, now, Julie talked um, about some of the use cases for the international models. So I will now focus on the scope. So the international content that SNOMED International develop, the scope of that includes the pharmaceutical and biological products in their more abstract form, and also vaccine products down to the medicinal product form only. We don't create clinical drugs for um, vaccines. 
And then what's out of scope of the international content are the real or actual products, the ones with the brand names um, that are authorised by the regulatory agencies within the countries. The international content does not include the packaging descriptions. Um, we, uh, out of scope is also the blood products, the um, food nutritional supplements and complementary medicines, um, the autologous um, medicinal products, and also, as I said, vaccine products at the clinical drug level. So that's the level with the strength. Now, there are a number of assumptions that were made in developing the international content. And these are quite important to understand because you'll see some implications of this when we have a closer look at the drug model itself. So I'll run through some of these fairly quickly and just highlight the ones that I'd like you to um, take note of. So the first couple are all about the fact that the model was designed based on description logic principles so that the medicinal product concepts are fully defined. It really takes advantage of classification and subsumption and defining each, each medicinal product concept sufficiently, necessarily and sufficiently. Um, requirements to align with external standards are explicitly documented, uh, such as uh, with IDMP. Uh, in the international content, we model using the um, proximal primitive modeling technique. So that means that these international concepts are all modeled using the medicinal product concept that I showed you. That's the, that's the primitive concept that is uh, at the top of this um, sub hierarchy. Uh, assumption five, concept model will not use the universal restriction in description logic. Now this is an important one because in the drugs world, we need to talk about products that contain only a specific set of ingredients. But doing this logic in description logic uh, creates classification that takes a long time. So the decision was made in order to stick within AL-EL um, prof AL profile to keep the classification um, within a reasonable time to avoid using universal restriction in description logic. So what that means is you'll see in the model that we've actually uh, created another way of doing it that classifies much more efficiently. So keep that in mind and we'll have a look at how we do that in the model. Uh, the concept model does not support nesting. So this basically means that all attribute values are single concepts. Uh, the international content is not intended on its own to support prescribing because it needs those branded products uh, and other products that are part of the extension in order to support the full prescribing use case. Um, and lastly, the international content is not intended to eliminate the need for a national extension. It just provides the foundation on which the extension can be created and that foundation for interoperability. So um, the information that we're giving in this tutorial uh, is mostly found in uh, a couple of places, but to um, learn more about the main international medicinal product model, you can go to this link, snowmed.org slash MPM. It stands for Medicinal Product Model. So in this document, it's got all of the attributes, the um, rules, ranges, and so forth, about each of the classes that I'm about to talk about in the international product. So let's give you a summary. Um, the, the other place to refer to is our editorial guide. There are a couple of sections in the editorial guide, but one of them is the pharmaceutical dose forms and the other is the pharmaceutical biologic product. So if you look inside here, you'll see a section on medicinal product. So the editorial guide provides the terming rules and the modeling rules that are associated with the international medicinal product model hierarchy. So this is a, a reference for us to con continue. So this is an overview of the international drug model You'll notice, oh, I wish there was a pointer. You'll notice that we're inside the pharmaceutical biologic product hierarchy and the medicinal product sub hierarchy. There are a number of, What's sorry, the there is. Hmm. I'll find it later. <laughs> there are a number of um, groupers, the medicinal groupers underneath. 
And once you get below the groupers, then these classes start. We have the medicinal product and medicinal product form, uh, medicinal product only, medicinal product form only, the medicinal product precise only, which doesn't appear very often in the international edition, um, but it can be added in the extension, which Julie will talk about, and the clinical drug. So here's a simple example uh, for amoxicillin containing product that's contained in an oral dose form. The MP only is amoxicillin only product. The MPF only is amoxicillin only product in oral dose form. And our clinical drug is amoxicillin 500 milligrams capsule. And you'll see that one of the groupers, and there's actually quite a few others, is penicillin containing product. This is the same example using the fully specified names. The fully specified names are constructed using the products containing, product containing only, and then product containing precisely. So notice how these first couple of words um, change as we go across, and that will become important for the attributes that we use. So this crazy diagram is meant to show you that the groupers, the medicinal product groupers, there are three main types, and then there are combinations. So I'm just going to quickly walk you through the three types of groupers we have. Under medicinal product, you'll see medicinal product characterized by disposition, medicinal product characterized by structure, and medicinal product characterized by therapeutic uh, role. So let's first look at groupers based on disposition. And it's easier, easiest to do this by having a look at the definition of this um, parent concept, medicinal product characterized by disposition. It's defined as any medicinal product that has an active ingredient that is a substance characterized by disposition. So over in the substance hierarchy, we have substances that have a disposition and this has disposition role on the substances is what gets the products classified under this particular category. So it's using the classification to group the products based on the substances they contain. So here's an example, product containing opioid receptor uh, agonist. And we've got an example product, a product containing methadone is in this grouper. And you'll see the definition that the product containing opioid receptor agonist has an active ingredient that is a substance with opioid receptor agonist mechanism of action. And because that has a disposition, it gets classified as a product under this um, medicinal product characterized by disposition. The next type of grouper we have is the grouper based on structure. And this works in a similar way. Medicinal products characterized by structure uh, have an active ingredient that is a substance characterized by structure. And once again, it's the substance hierarchy that drives the classification of these products into these different categories. So here's an example, a product containing carbohydrate uh, and a um, product in this might be product containing ascorbic acid. And here's the definition of the product containing carbohydrate, just to show you that it has an active ingredient of carbohydrate. And if we look in the substance hier hierarchy, carbohydrate is a subtype of substance characterized by structure. And it's that substance relationship that creates that classification. And then the third main type of uh, grouper is the grouper based on therapeutic role. So the definition of this concept, medicinal product characterized by therapeutic role, is it's any medicinal product that plays a role of therapeutic role. So this is an interesting one, and we'll see that in some of the examples, because the classification actually works using two axioms, <laughs> and we'll get to an example of that. But these are roles like... Um, uh, let's look at an example, anti-infective agent or antifungal agent. So that's one example. And the medicinal product acting as antifungal agent is one that the, plays the role of antifungal therapeutic role. And these roles are qualify out values. So have a look out for some of the product examples I show you later. You'll see this plays role and the plays role helps to group 
under the appropriate um, therapeutic role group of, and I'll show you how that does how it does that when we get to some examples. Um, here's an early example of a medicinal product containing penicillin and acting as antibacterial agent. This is actually one of those combined groupers that uses both the therapeutic role and also uses the, um, the structure of the penicillin. So that was a really quick overview of the groupers that sit above the main classes. But let's move on now to the main classes. And as Julie mentioned, um, the medicinal product hierarchy includes concepts in what we call the open world view and also concepts in the closed world view. So everything over here, we call them containing products. They represent products that contain an ingredient, but they might contain additional ingredients. In the closed world view part of the model, the products contain only the ingredients that are stated. And because we can't use the description logic, um, the description logic um, mechanisms for that, we've introduced some attributes to help support that. So let's quickly <laughs> start in the top left and start with our medicinal products. This is in the open world view. So a medicinal product, or we sometimes call it an MP containing product, is an abstract representation of the medicinal product based on a description of the active ingredient substances. And this is important, regardless of any modifications of those active ingredient substances, but not exclusively limited by those substances. So what that means is that if you have a product containing amoxicillin, it may contain additional ingredients. So a product containing amoxicillin and clavulanic acid would be a type of product containing amoxicillin. That's how the open world uh, assumption works. And I've got the templates for the fully specified names for these. And the main defining attribute for this class is has active ingredient substance. And it sits in a role group and every ingredient that a product contains sits in a separate role group. So if you have three ingredients, you have three role groups. And you'll see later that that helps to group together the strength with the appropriate ingredient. So here's an example, and I've included both the stated and the inferred definitions. In the stated definition, we have that has active ingredient uh, relationship to codeine. Uh, you'll notice that we're stating it based on the proximal primitive parent because of the modeling approach to medicinal product. But when you classify it, you pick up all of these grouper concepts that I described before. And our product that we've got here, the codeine containing product, you'll notice that it has children like aspirin and codeine containing product because we're using the open world assumption anything as long as it contains codeine is a type of this, but it may contain additional products. So the ones highlighted with the red box around them are also um, other types of medicinal product containings. And then we've also got these subtypes, the codeine only, which is the MP only, and we'll talk about that shortly. We've got the MPF containing subtypes, codeine containing product in oral dose form. And these subtypes, are the ones that we'll talk about next. So we're gonna move on to the second open world containing class, which is the MPF containing class. Now this is the same in that it represents an abstract representation of the active ingredient substances, regardless of any modification and not exclusively to the substances. But this time we add a dose form grouper concept based on the intended site of administration. Now the dose form groupers are the immediate children of pharmaceutical dose form. So they provide that um, reference to the intended site. There's the fully specified name pattern. We've got the product containing the substance in the dose form with intended site uh, and a semantic tag of medicinal product form. In addition to the active ingredient, we also introduce the manufactured dose form attribute. So here's an example, and I promised to show you an example that has plays role. 
So this example is for a product containing codeine in an oral dose form. You'll see in the stated definition, it's defined based on the proximal primitive, which is medicinal product. It's got the manufactured dose form of oral dose form, which is that grouper under the pharmaceutical dose forms. It's got the active ingredient of codeine. And then that's one axiom. So the definition of this uh, codeine containing product in an oral dose form is equivalent to a medicinal product with the manufactured dose form of oral dose form and has active ingredient. This second axiom here is not an equivalent. This says that if you have a this concept, it belongs under, um, it plays the role of the um, anti, I can't read that, anti-tussive, Antitussive. Antitussive, the antitussive, thank you, Julie, the antitussive therapeutic role. <laughs> <laughs> so what this little axiom does is that it allows anything that is under this concept to be a subtype of this therapeutic role grouper without necessarily including that role in the definition. So what that means is that you don't always have to add the play's role to every subtype because it will inherit that from its parent, but it will still be equivalent as long as it has those top equivalent axioms. So... Um, more than one, um, one more. Play's role? Yeah, and if it's antitussive, it's also yeah, absolutely. That would just sit in an additional axiom, a non-equivalent axiom, to say that it's also a type of that, but that doesn't fully define the concept. So that's a way of saying that anything that's a subtype of this will automatically inherit the player's role, but you don't need that to define it on every subtype to make it uh, subsume under this concept. And once again, when we classify this and get the inferred view, we get these grouper concepts that are created, um, which, which picks up the, um, the therapeutic roles. You'll see the top grouper that um, after the classification is the medicinal product acting as the antitussive agent. And here we have a product containing codeine in oral dose form. You remember we're on the containing side, the open world side. So we have subtypes that add additional ingredients. So a product containing aspirin and codeine in oral dose form is a type of product containing codeine. Uh, and then in addition to the other MPF containing concepts, we also have this product containing only codeine in oral dose form, and we'll get to that one when we see the MPF only classes. So we've done the open world side, and now we're on to the closed world side. We'll start with the medicinal product only, the MP only class. So the difference with between the MP only and the MP containing is, as we've said, that you can only have the ingredients that are specified. So a product containing amoxicillin only represents products containing only amoxicillin as the base. They might have other modifications to the base, but there, there are no additional active ingredients. The semantic tag for these is the same, medicinal product, but we add the word only into the fully specified name. And then this is the key attribute here, to avoid using description logic, um, universal, uh, um, we've added this count of the base active ingredient. And what this does is that it means that no longer is amoxicillin plus carbulanic acid a subtype of this MP only product because it doesn't have a count of one of the base of active ingredient. So it kind of simulates the uh, universal logic without using the, um, the, um, class the description logic features. So here's an example. The MP only has the important count of the base of active ingredients, which is one in this example. 
and the active ingredient is codeine. When we classify this, it picks up any groupers, which there aren't, no, it picks up the MP containing, it picks up the product containing codeine parent. And here we have over here a slightly simpler sub hierarchy. We've got our codeine only product here. This is our MP only product. The parent is the MP containing product and the children we have the uh, MPF only, codeine only product in oral dose form. And also there's a codeine only product in parenteral dose form. So we're still on the closed world side, moving down to the MPF only. Trying to make this exciting, but <laughs> um, this we'll kind of skip over. There's no new attributes. We've got the manufactured dose form that we had in the MPF containing. We've got the counter base, base active ingredient that we got from the MP only. And we've always had the has active ingredients. So there's not really a lot else other than to say that the semantic tag is the medicinal product form. And you see the important word only in the fully specified name. A quick example, we have the product containing only codeine in oral dose form. And once again, the inferred definition and the sub hierarchy. So we're down at the MPF only here. And you'll see that the parents are both the MP only, the product containing only codeine, and the MPF containing, that's the product containing codeine oral dose form. And the subtypes here are the clinical drugs that we'll talk about soon. You'll see the strengths in here. So next to final class, this is the medicinal product precise only. This is a class that doesn't appear in the international model very often, but it can be added if required to the extension model. Um, it just helps to round out and explain the, uh, the has precise active ingredient uh, attribute. So once again, this is a closed world concept. The ingredients that it states are the only ingredients in the, in the um, concept. But the main difference is that we're talking about the precise active ingredient. So this includes the modifications of your ingredient um, with the exception of the hydrations or solvates. So the new attributes that we have to talk about, we talked about the count of the base active ingredient which was relevant to distinguish, um, to ensure that we don't have additional ingredients added in the subtypes. But once you add modifications, there is an opportunity for there to be some conflict. And so we introduce these additional attributes only when required. So there's a count of the base and modification pair and a count of the precise active ingredient. And the actual ingredient attribute is a subtype of the has active ingredient. It becomes the has precise active ingredient, which is a subtype of that attribute. So this table attempts to explain this very difficult area um, in order to simulate this um, universal restriction description logic feature um, at the base level, it's quite easy because a count of the base active ingredients will help to avoid any additional ingredients being added. Unfortunately, there are a few products that have two ingredients that have the same base. And so if you have a look at products like amlodipine, bezalate, um, and hepastatin calcium, yes, they both have a base of amlodipine. No, is you have you have two bases. You have oh, base wonderful! And yes. So and this is an example of where there are two active ingredients. So the count of the base active ingredient is two. Wonderful! That's very good. And now in this example, we do have the two ingredients with the same base: uh, bethamethasone sodium phosphate and bethamethasone acetate. So if we count the number of base ingredients, there's only one of them, but there's two ingredients. So we can run into trouble with additional ingredients being added. So when we're looking at the precise active ingredient, we do need to count the modifications, but only in these situations where they have the same base, because we're trying to avoid 
um, you know, adding additional attributes unnecessarily. So in this case, where there is the same base and more than one ingredient, we do need to add the count of the base and modification pair, which in this case is two, because it helps to distinguish between those. And then the third case is extremely rare, and we struggled to find some realistic examples for this, but this is a case where not only is the base the same between the two ingredients, but also the, one of the modifications. So uh, insulin aspartate and insulin aspartate protamine. There are a couple of other cases where you've got two modifications to the same base, and there may be a case where uh, one of those modifications and the base is the same in two different ingredients. So only if you're in that situation would you add the count of the precise active ingredient. Okay, so here's a quick example. This is not in the international edition because these classes often or usually don't get added. But as I said, we've got the count of the base active ingredient and the this should read precise active ingredient of codeine phosphate. See the modification is added there. In the name of this concept, we've got codeine phosphate precisely product because we're talking about the precise active ingredient rather than just the base. And underneath it is the clinical drug that we'll be talking about shortly, the codeine phosphate five milligrams per mil oral solution. Okay, so finally, we're onto the clinical drug. This is where the rest of the international attributes come in. So the clinical drug is defined in terms of the precise active ingredient. And we've just talked about what that is. That includes the ingredient base and the modifications. We've got the stated basis of strength substance, the substance uh, on which the strength is stated. And we have the um, strength with that. And the strength is either represented as a presentation strength with a unit of presentation that tends to be used for the discrete uh, drugs, uh, usually solids, for example, like tablets, and the concentration strengths, which tends to be used for the continuous um, dose forms. And the third thing is the manufactured dose form, which we have looked at in the MPFs, but at a, um, a deeper level of detail. At this level, our semantic tag is clinical drug, and we include the substances, the strengths, and the dose form in that definition. So as I said, there are two ways to represent the strength. So this is the list of attributes you would see for a clinical drug with a presentation strength. We have the unit of presentation, which is, and this is using ECL, the descendants of unit of presentation, and these four attributes, the presentation strength numerator, value and units, and the presentation strength denominator, value and units. Uh, and here's a quick example. We have product containing precisely codeine phosphate, 30 milligrams, each in conventional release oral tablet. Now you'll see in this definition, here's the role group that the precise active ingredient in is in. We've got this specialized precise active ingredient and then the base of strength substance and the presentation strengths uh, attributes are all included in the same role group. And we'll see an example later where there's a second ingredient and that will have a separate role group with the um, respective strength and ingredient characteristics. We've also got the has unit of presentation of tablet up the top. And then the second strength representation is using the concentration strength for continuous dose forms. And similarly, we have the concentration strength numerator value units, denominator value and units. And here's an example of this one. We've got fewer ungrouped attributes because we don't have that unit of presentation. And then we've got the four concentration strength. So that was a quick overview of the international model classes. This is an example of the full um, set of concepts that we looked through for the examples from the coding containing product, the coding containing product in oral dose form. Remember that was in the open world. And in the closed world, we looked at the codeine only product, the codeine only product in parental dose form, and the codeine phosphate five milligrams per mil solution for injection. And there's the fully specified name of those. Now, before I finish up the international model, I just wanted to show you one example with um, more than one ingredient. 
So here is an aspirin and codeine containing product. Um, the classes look quite similar down to the aspirin 325 milligrams and codeine 30 milligram of oral tablet. But you'll notice that this MP containing has two MP containing parents because the aspirin and codeine containing product is an aspirin containing product and it's also a codeine containing product. And then similarly, the MPF containing has two parents. It's an aspirin containing product in oral dose form and a codeine containing product in oral dose form. So when you add the extra ingredients, you do get a few extra layers at the containing side as it unwraps each ingredient. And there's the fully specified name. As I've mentioned, you see the two raw groups because you have the two ingredients with all of the strengths that belong to those. Now, I've introduced the attributes of the clinical drug, but here's just a list of them all together. You'll notice that the values of those attributes include substances, pharmaceutical dose forms, units of measure, units of presentation, roles, and then there are some concrete values for the um, strengths with decimals and integers for the counts. Now, these will become important when we talk later about how to create the drug model. Um, but also when Alejandro talks later about querying the drug model, it's important to note that not only can you query the definitions of the drugs model, but you can also dive into the substances and dose forms and query some of their defining properties as well. So for example, if you're uh, looking at a product and you don't know what dose form you want, but you know uh, that you want one with a particular administration method or a particular intended site or a particular dose form characteristic, then you can dive through the, uh, the medicinal product to the manufactured dose form and then onto these attributes in here using a simple ECL query. So these are the defining attributes of the pharmaceutical dose form. I've read most of them, probably not the has dose form transformation. And here's an example of the um, dose forms. Conventional release oral tablet is a type of oral tablet with a basic dose form of tablet, a dose form intended side of oral, a dose form release characteristic of conventional release. There's no dose form transformation and a dose form administration method of swallow. So these are all things that are available for querying. And similarly for substances, substances can have the disposition, which we saw in the product groupers, and they can be a modification of another substance. Here's a quick example of codeine hydrochloride, uh, which has a disposition of opioid receptor agonist and is a modification of codeine. And as Julie mentioned, all of these attributes that I've talked about are available for browsing in our machine readable concept model browser. If you go to browser.snomedtools.org slash MRCM, or you can just go to the browser website itself and click on the button that's just below the international edition and the QA analysis. Um, you can come in here and browse through all of these attributes. If you um, particularly go to the pharmaceutical biologic product domain, or the medicinal product package domain, which has the attributes that Julie will be talking about, you can see the valid attributes in each of these domains uh, with their grouping, their cardinalities, and also their valid range in the right-hand side. So. <laughs> really, we're all about extension around. Thank you, Linda. And Ami is still just about awake, <laughs> otherwise I'll make you shake down. Okay, national extensions. You know, that's part of what we have, why we're all here. Um, we have this wonderful model whereby we have this central core and we can add on things um, that we need in our own particular worlds. That might be to enable translation, that might be to map to other code systems where, um, where those are in use and overlap with the domains of SNOMED CT. And one of the main ones that I think uh, many countries use, many members use, is to customize the terminology to their own needs when it's relevant only to the local clinical context. Well, 
uh, and uh, particularly if that's outside of the defined scope of the international edition. We talked earlier about this challenge of med medicines being authorised by our national regulatory agencies or our, our agencies within jurisdiction. And so this is a prime example of where we need our national extension, but it is so intertwined with the international, which is why Linda went through that. It's not just dependent, it is intertwined. We use the same logical design, the same distribution format, and, and the same subtyping, but we also reuse many of those, those attributes. These are the general principles. We go a little beyond that because our use cases go beyond that. In the international, we're very careful to say, we're not actually supporting the process of prescribing. I suspect if you have a national medicinal ter product terminology and you can't support prescribing, you're really not much good because that's what we do. Similarly, dispensing. If you can't dispense the drug, I mean, you know, if you can't record its dispensing, if you can't reimburse it, if you can't do the tracking and tracing to make sure you've not got fraudulent medicines, uh, what are you doing? And we need to record administration and particularly that growth of the closed loop medication systems where you scan the prescription, which is machine processable. You scan the patient and you scan the box and it, the, the logic works through. Is this the right thing? Uh, a real sort of safety um, development. So we have this local extension and we have some local decisions to be made. Um, within the international, we have that clear scope that Linda talked about. Locally, you will have to think about. Um, it's easy to say all licensed medicines. Um, the ones that are valid within your own jurisdiction. Um, those might include things that are over the counter, particularly if you're trying to build a very longitudinal record. But you might also want to include unlicensed medicines, things that were licensed and aren't now. Um, things that aren't licensed in your own jurisdiction, but are licensed in another one uh, that you actually need to use. Some of the smaller countries, um, this is an absolute um, Im important thing um, for take just Britain and Ireland. There are a whole set of normal therapeutic products that are not actually licensed in Ireland because the the company doesn't pay the process for that. And so they're, they're imported. Um, Things that probably in the larger countries we would consider you know, normal items of practice. And they need to appear in a national extension because they're used every day. You might need to include things that are standard formulae. In my own world, if it says BP or British Pharmacopeia by it, um, we probably need to include it. Um, investigational medicines, as we get translational um medicine and, and bench to bedside type things, a whole load of things are getting part authorizations, often designations. I can see some nods of people that are, are dealing with this sort of interim state now. Um, and we need to record that in patient records. So all of those uh, start to become uh, an important consideration for local decisions. And then there's all those things that are clearly out of scope for the international for all sorts of reasons, but that might be deeply in scope for you. Herbal medicines, traditional medicines, um, more of the, the national formulae type things, possibly even some hospital specific formulae if that hospital is one that affects the entire uh, national practice. You know, if you come to my world, if Great Ormond Street Hospital says, this is how you use this, uh, this is how you make this pediatric presentation, we all go, yes, thank you very much, and, and copy. Um, and Linda 
I think it highlighted that there are some things where we only do concentration strength in the international release and locally, particularly for the prescribing, but even more for the dispensing use case, we need the presentation strength um, representation. The, the classic, and I've put amounts, it should say amples, sorry about that. My finger in my brain was not in, in the... Um, in coordination, amples, vials, prefilled syringes, the, the absolute classics, but also the unit dose vials of things like the nebulizer solutions and sachets of liquid paracetamol or liquid um, ibuprofen when you just squeeze them into your child's mouth when, the, um, when you're having to travel with a sick child. But one of the absolute considerations you will need locally is some is the reliable sources for the definitional attributes. We in the DUSG we're starting to explore how we can um, come together to 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 work through that. So this is the model overview, and it has the fundamental guiding principle of international op interoperability. You know the in a sense, the Pierre use case, uh, patient travels from country A to country B, the IPS type, uh, international patient summary type use case, and the cross-border dispen um, dispensing and prescribing use case. Um, Linda has talked about, am I allowed to move? No, I'm not allowed to move, am I? All these things on the left-hand side, MP containing, MPF containing, MPO, that, thank you. <laughs> and, the, and the camera's got, isn't it? off-putting to have all of those clicks. I feel like some, some international model, except that I'm not. <laughs> um, so all those things over here, Linda's already talked about. I'm gonna be talking about the things on the right-hand side, the darker colors, I've tried to do a bit with the color here. And, and it's this little outlier at the bottom. So we have the RMP, the real medicinal product. Um, the real clinical drug and the real packaged clinical drug. These are real things because we can go, certainly at the package level and also at the RCD level, you can touch them. They are real. We are representing real things. Everything else is an abstraction, but those are real things. You might need to attach GS1 codes to them. They are real things. Um, there's an example. You, you can see, you, as with all models, um, it's an art as well as a science. I had it laid out vertically. This has it laid out horizontally. So, um, but roughly in the same pattern. I'm looking, and why we've chosen something that I can't say, I don't know. Ax itinib, um, which um, is a Pfizer product uh, branded as in lighter. And um, it's only been around a little while. So there are no generics. You just have to um, have the brand name of Inlighter. And in that example, um, we've put some words. Something I will come on to is as soon as you're into the national extensions, you need your own editorial policy. So we've, we've made up the fully specified names there. We could have used different patterns um, and we certainly haven't tried to do preferred terms. That's a real consideration as you go to national extensions. Uh, a couple of points to note. Once we're into this real world, we, it's all closed worldview. It's all universal restriction. There will be the counts. Um, when you're in a realm, the things that are licensed will contain only what they say they will. There is no uncertainty. We cannot afford that in clinical practice. So every class will use the, the ingredient counts. Um, like all things of beauty and nature, the model has symmetry um, where the national extension concepts are subtypes of the international. We don't show an RMPF. Um, a real medicinal product form class of concepts. Um, nobody's brought us a use case to need that. And to be honest, if there's no use case, let's not do it. But if someone does, it is processable. 
And the other thing about this is that there is, although the model is as it is, there is a real optionality here. Um, you may not need all of these classes depending on your national culture and practice. Here in Portugal, everything is managed at PAC level. RPCD is what drives everything, same in Germany. Uh, you come to the UK, everything is managed more, more or less at that clinical drug level with also the, 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 v, the, VT, the medicinal product only. Um, different cultures, different practices. So that level of optionality within the model is there. And when we go down to packages, we're dealing with a partitive relationship and the objects are part of the package. Um, everything that you need in terms of the, um, the attributes should be present and suitably defined in the MRCM, but the values that you need to populate those attributes will need to be in your national extension. Um, you know, supplier. We can't just put in Pfizer Inc. as the global thing because in each country you'll have your own um, local variation of that. And one of the use cases of telling clinicians who the supplier is, is if there's an issue, they need to know where to go. And they're probably not going to be able to afford to ring the US, even if there was a free phone number, it won't work outside the US and Canada. So you need to say what your local organization is, and therefore you need to build up that local dictionary. Um, but if you're looking at something like a substance or a dose form or a unit of presentation, which is like unlikely, really, we, in order to maintain that interoperability use case, those should come from the international. Um, there is an or in there. That is, um, sometimes you can't wait. I know we've gone to monthly releases, um, but, you know, in the case of Tosim um, the you know, the, the first of the COVID vaccines, we all had to do as fast as we possibly could in the time available. But generally speaking, um, please, if it's things that you should find in the, the in the main content, then we would we, be asking for CRS requests for that. And if you are going to try and get this whole aim of facilitating international interoperability, we need to follow the proximal primitive modeling pattern. Now, if you were at the DEUSG on Wednesday, we started to venture into places where we might not with some of the group of concepts and some of the difficult things like the TPN, the total parental nutrition solutions and so on. But for your standard one, two, three ingredient substance medicines, may, you know, depending on how we go, it's the proximal primitive because that is what will make our classifications all work together. So, how am I doing? Oh, there. The RMP, um, just as in the MP, we were looking at a very abstract concept that, you know, the top of things just defined on the basis of their active ingredient substances. This is what we're doing here, but attaching some sort of trade or brand name to it. Um, and, you know, what's the use case? Well, you know, we've all heard, oh, you know, I, I, I had Ventolin when I was a child. Did they have the syrup because they were really little? Did they have the inhaler? We don't know. We don't actually, in that case, know whether it was um, oral or inhalational. So we, you know, we couldn't use a, a lower class. But I can use something that's that I can record in their history, saying, well, they had Ventolin in their childhood, and because of the rules of subsumption, I can then know they had salbutamol. So that is, is possibly the main use case for that very airy fairy um, top level class. Another one is in protocol management where you want to take a patient up or down a dosing um, with a very specific product that you prescribe a brand. 
um, the prolonged release opiates would be a good example. You've got a patient who was stable on 30 milligrams of one particular product, uh, prolonged release morphine, for example, um, and they're getting a lot of breakthrough pain. So you want to take them just up one level within that whole brand tree because that's worked for them. <clears throat> And, and as we said, pharmacovigilance, which is in outside of general patient care, but is that whole thing about population safety, is another really good example where we will often get, you know, I've had an adverse reaction to Ventolin, or I've had, you know, and that's all they will tell us. So that's, this is a useful class for that. But remember, it's, it is a grouper concept, just like the MP is in, in the international. I skipped two. No, I've only skipped one. Um, so the attributes are, it's got the same two as in the international, um, in the MP, so the count and the active ingredient, but it's got two additional ones, has supplier, has product name, because we're in that real brand, you know, that real part mm -hmm. where I can say there is a supplier, there is a product name. And we can template it out like that. Came out very large there. Um, and look at some examples, both in the um, stated view and the inferred view. And you can see there in the inferred view that it subsumes nicely under the product containing only simvastatin. This, this is so cool. Um, similarly, with multi ingredient substances, um, this is. Energy, which is simvastatin and um, that also because it's we're in the only side of the world, the, the closed side of the world, so we have the count attributes, it subsumes nicely on where it wants to go. There are some challenges. We absolutely need to manage this same set of active ingredient substances. Um, and that's really quite challenging when you've got some brand families. This is quite a busy slide and I'm not gonna go through it now, but it's particularly in the OTC arena where um, you have a, a, a trusted brand name, which in my culture is something like Benelin. You know, if, if you've got anything wrong that is either a dry cough or a chesty cough or just a miserable cough, take Benelin. And then, you know, they've started to, to diversify into different active ingredient substances. And that starts to become a challenge. Uh, and there are various options that you could um, adopt within a national extension. You could also start to build a hierarchy of, um, I don't think I've got a slide for that. No, I haven't. Um, a hierarchy of uh, product names, but that gets really complex and you'd have to be sure of your use cases. I don't know if any of you know the classic example of where brand name and active substance has failed. It's, um, it's a UK example, but um, it's fairly well known. You know, Anadin is a classic brand name for analgesia. When I first started, that was aspirin. Later on, there actually became an anodine paracetamol. And we had cases, people coming in to our uh, emergency department, overdosed on anodine. So they're treated uh, with forced diuresis for uh, salicylate poisoning. And they die a week later from liver failure from paracetamol. So this is something to be really careful about. Having said that, our regulatory agencies have, have learned from that experience and they're trying to not have that. But you see, you know, it's it's that um, difficult interaction between the, the public and the professions association between names and what's actually inside them. So this is a challenging class to use well. Another challenge with this is so many of us have generic uh, products. And do I really want to know that this is um, Simvastatin in Sandos? If you look at RX Norm, they've got a very distinctive way of managing those generics um, and, and building them up into, um, I mean, they don't count as semantic branded drugs. 
that they you, you would pen the company name to them. And that, again, will really depend on what your use case is in your national extension, how you want to do that, and whether there is any value in it. So I need to race on. Linda had stolen a few of my minutes. Um, so I'm going on to the RCD. Um, this is like a CD, but it's a real thing. It probably has a brand name. It may not, but it does come from a single supplier. And we're really down here at truly supporting prescribing dispensing administration. And particularly sometimes when a branded product must be prescribed and must be dispensed, like lithium with its bioavailability, warfarin, the prolonged release opiates and so forth. Um, it's got the reimbursement cases. It's got you can start to support allergy checking of excipients, so the excipients of concern that the EMA list out. And again, it's it's a classic for pharmacovigilance use. Um, it has these same two uh, main attributes of has supplier and product name, plus all the attributes that Linda talked about for clinical drug in the international. And so then when you template it out, it's quite big. And there's an example of Zocor 40 milligram tablets in its stated view. So having done proximal primitive uh, authoring on it and um, in its inferred view where um, hopefully it says, it, yes, it says it's an RMP, it's a child of, of Zocor and it's a child of Simvastatin 40 milligram oral tablets in the international. There are real opportunities around the RCD class. Um, and this is something I think as we go forward and more and more of you are implementing a national extension that we need to explore. How to work with general excipient substances and their different roles of flavor, preservative, sweetener, filler, da, 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 da. And how we manage excipients of concern things like benzalkonium chloride that, that we again talked on, about on the DEUSG. Um, name parts, something that IDMP is really keen on, um, something that you will also see in some HL7 um, implementations um, and the use cases or otherwise for those. You might want to add authorization information and you will no doubt want to add availability information because there's no point trying to dispense something that isn't available. Did I give too far forwards? Yes, I did. So there's one other thing I want to talk about at the clinical drug, and this is the thorny issue of presentation strength for liquid clinical drugs. Um, there is this thing in the international that for liquids, we only represent the concentration strength. But when we come to clinical practice, we need things like an 80 milligram per two mil vial. We need things like a 300 milligram per 3.3 mil syringe. And we want to prescribe them. We certainly need to dispense them, need to do compliance checking on them and all sorts of things. And that is possible. You can add in, into the your national extension, this representation of both concentration and presentation strength so that things will classify correctly. Um, the sorts of things we're talking about, amples, vials, syringes, cartridges, et cetera. Um, oral pr products that are presented in an or, uh, a unit dose form and some of the pulmonary products similarly. And so it's the usual attributes for clinical drug, as in a concentration strength, but also a unit of presentation size quantity, which will be a decimal, because we might be down at something like 0.3 mils for uh, um, something like a subcutaneous syringe, and a unit of presentation size unit. And this allows that um, additional attribute to be a specialization of the existing clinical, clinical drug, and it will um, classify correctly. And we've done quite a lot of testing on that. One of the challenges around that, and that's back to national extensions, is your terming pattern. Because 
in a sense, the FSN should still be, for this sort of example, 80 milligram per mil. But what a clinician needs to see, and most patient safety agencies will enforce that, is 80 milligram per two mil. Tell me how much there is in total. And so that uh, uh, um, additional description will need to be authored. There is an alternative modeling in which you do both the presentation strength and the classic and the concentration strength, and you need the two role groups. And it does give the um, correct classification. But I mean, just in the little bit of testing that we did, it, we found it very, very labor intensive. Uh, so we're recommending this pattern. And there it is in, in templated form. There it is in, in an example um, using, I think, gentamicin. And you can see both, that's how you would do it in the stated view with the proximal primitive modeling. And that's what would come up in the inferred view. So I very need, quickly need to move on to package clinical drug. This is an abstract class. It's not in the international because pack size is a national issue and we would get at the international combinatorial explosion. You have to be quite careful about that at the national because your product literature may well say, and we're going to do it in pack sizes of two, five, 10, 20, 30, and 50. And then there's that little word, not all pack sizes may be marketed. And you end up with a whole load of work that is irrelevant to clinical practice. Um, so you just need to be careful with pack size. But one of the main use cases for this is reimbursement. A lot of countries now will give a, in a sense, an abstract price. Um, this is the price for 28 tablets. This is what you're going to pay. We're going to pay you. Doesn't matter which brand or which generic you dispense. You might make some money on it. You might lose some money on it. This is the price we're going to give you. And that's, that's really helpful uh, to have this place to put that. It's also useful for interchangeability and substitution. And, you know, it's the linking class. It's the thing that we need in order to be able to get the, the real packaged clinical drug. And we need that as well for kit products, where we have more than one clinical drug in a package, um, of which there are many, like um, something like Canestian combi with a cream and a pessary, but also any type of phasic oral contraceptive, um, any of the HRT products where you've got more than one clinical drug in the thing that you present to the patient. Please, please. Oh, thank you. Um, as I said before, it's, it's, it's around the composition relationship, the positive type thing. The, this is because the, the pack contains a clinical drug or more than one clinical drug. Um, and that also means if you're wishing to display this information in that sort of standard tree view that we're all quite used to these days, um, and you wish to display your product, your packages, in a sense, underneath your products, um, you're going to have to do some manipulation. And particularly if you want to transfer information like the product role across, you're gonna have to do a little bit of gymnastics um, in, in the technical areas. Everything here is closed worldview and not just count of active ingredients, now we're count of CDs, because what I don't want is for a pack where I've got two different CDs, I don't want them to classify in the wrong place because you know that CD is an only. Uh, I can't afford for um, an estradiol only tablet to have an eth um, a norethisterone tablet classifying underneath it. It's just not right. So we have to put this, this count of CD in there to make that work. And that means this is our set of attributes, the count of the clinical drug, the contains clinical drug, and the two pack size attributes. It is role grouped, but for anything other than one of these kit type products, it would be just one-to-one -one, really. The other thing about this is that your proximal primitive concept to, to work to is the package. 
And that means we get quite a flat hierarchy under package, which is why if you want to display the package with the clinical drug, it's not just simple subsumption. But we haven't managed to, to truly find a way around that. Um, but your, your proximal primitive is the package. And there's a couple of examples. And I, I put a little thing here, difference. There isn't one. Don't sort of get your glasses out and study high, hard. Because this is very flat, there aren't those classes. It's just the package under the proximal primitive. So if we go back to the real side, and I really must rush, mustn't I? Package, the real package clinical drug, it's, um, it's about dispensing and administration. It's about compliance monitoring, anti-counterfeiting, reimbursement, all of those very practical things that make our world work. Um, and we have the relationships, as we've said, some authorities here in Portugal, they license by package. Uh, so you might need to hold additional information here. Again, we're down at the closed world view. Um, and we're, we're not requiring that um, if, if, if extensions require the RPCD, they're advised to define them using RCDs, not CDs from the international, just because it, it makes things more easily implementable, things flow through classification better. So, you know, if you are Portugal and life exists at RPCD, actually building RCDs is worth it and adds value, particularly for ease of international interoperability. Those are the attributes, the same as you would find on the pack, um, on the on the PCD and the additional ones, um, yeah, the count and, and the drug size. What we haven't got here is product name and supplier. And we've had quite a few discussions about this and whether they, because you've said contains clinical drug and what you're likely to do is, is put an RCD in there, it will have the product name and the supplier. But in many countries, um, the supplier actually may be different at the product to the package as things get relabeled. Um, uh, in, in France, this is the difference between the titulaire and the exploitant, which I finally learned. Um, and that's something that needs to be considered as you look in, in your different uh, national extensions, something that DMD at the moment isn't doing correctly, um, which, is, which is really quite challenging. There's the template. Um, there's an example. Again, there's not much difference because it's a very flat uh, representation of things. Other considerations that you need to think about, it is possible we have the attributes. If you need to add the extra things into the pack, um, the applicator, the spoon or whatever, you could describe the container, the box, the tube. You can again describe excipients. And if your use case requires it, you can uh, describe sub packs. If you need to say that in your box of 28, you have two blisters of 14, you can do but you need to be sure of your use cases because obviously it's more work. These are the attributes, the, the has product name. I think I've already mentioned that. I'm not going to go there. As I said previously, you can have a hierarchy. I've pulled out Zovirax. That's great. It's all about acyclovir. I'm not in any conflict there. Similarly with Adalat, it's all about nifedipine. I'm not in conflict there. But, you know, that big proviso, the product name must apply to a single act in active ingredient substance set. Has supplier. Again, be careful if it's, you may have very different information from RCD to RPCD. Um, particularly if you have parallel importing, um, some of the, the relabeling that happens in the, in, the, um, in the US and elsewhere. And if, you're, um, if you do have a lot of importing, which supplier you want to say to that, whether it's the importer or the license holder. 
And oh, one last thing there, in the real world, suppliers change. How are you going to manage what is in theory a definitional attribute? Um, we've talked a little about the count already. I'm not going to go there. Um, yeah, I'm going to rush through these. Otherwise, we're going to be running out of time. The one thing I want to emphasize here it's just like we have patterns in the clinical drugs. You need patterns in your pack size and pack size unit. You need consistency to be able to do things like dose checking, compliance checking, that closed loop medication that I was talking about, which is such a safety benefit. We need those patterns and those consistency to really get the value out of machine processable information. And I think that's nearly me done. Editorial guide or guides. You, we need our, each of us need our own. Um, they need to be in harmony with the international. Um, otherwise we're not going to get this interoperability, but you need to talk about which classes you're going to cover, which products are in scope, what your terming pattern is in your own language or languages and the sort of editorial rules that you're going to put onto this beautiful model because that's where the um the messiness of life is so thanks julie um i'm now going to talk about how you take this beautiful model and create a national drug dictionary and i'm going to give the clicker a run for its money to see how we can go through. Now, I mentioned before that we're in the pharmaceutical biologic product hierarchy, and in particular, the medicinal product and medicinal product pack sub hierarchies. So how do we create a model where we're adding concepts to these hierarchies? We've seen the international drug model. We've seen the drug extension model with the real and the package products. And there it is as a whole. Now, when you're creating a national drug dictionary, it's important to understand where to start. And the place to start is the most specific concepts or the leaf nodes in your model. So in this case, if you have a look down below the medicinal product sub hierarchy, you'll see that the leaf class is that real clinical drug. And if you have a look down below the medicinal product package sub hierarchy, you'll see that the leaf node is that real package clinical drug. So they're the two concepts that we're going to start with. And we're going to take our source of truth which is usually the regulatory or licensing information for a drug. And we're going to populate those and use that at the, as the starting point for creating our national drug dictionary. Oops, let's go back. So if we think about this slide and we kind of shake out the classes a bit to get these leaf nodes at the bottom, the next, next slide shows the model shaken up with those two classes at the bottom. And you'll see our real package drug where we're starting below the medicinal product package. And you'll see the real clinical drug below the medicinal product. So they're the two classes that we're gonna start from. And then the process of creating your national drug dictionary is kind of a two-step process. Firstly, you take your regulatory uh, drug information from your summary of product characteristics or whatever your um, national version of that is, and you define your real clinical drug, the most specific concept. Once you have that, you classify that. And if it subsumes under the clinical drug and the real medicinal uh, product, then your job's done. But if there happen to be no clinical drug that it subsumes under or no real medicinal product that it subsumes under, you may need to create that for the first time. So similarly with the real package drug as the second step, once you have your real clinical drugs, then you package them up into the real clinical drug and then classify it and see whether there is a package clinical drug that already exists. If it does, happy days and you're done. If there's not, you may need to uh, finish that off. So I'm going to get a bit clicker happy and step through that process uh, just to show you. Now, this process is one that can either be done manually or it can be automated. So I'll show you the process manually and then it can be done in, in either of those ways. So the example I'm going to walk through is for a Zocor 40 milligram film coated tablet. And we're going to start with step one, which is to create our real clinical drug, the bottom of that part of the hierarchy. 
But before we do, <laughs> we need to make sure we have all our attribute values. You remember before we talked about all of the defining attributes? We need to make sure that the substances that are defined within our um, summary of product characteristics or our regulatory data uh, are created as SNOMED concept in the substance hierarchy. We need to ensure that we have the pharmaceutical dose forms that we need uh, as a descendant of the pharmaceutical dose form hierarchy. Uh, as part of supporting that, SNOMED International is uh, dose forms to the SNOMED pharmaceutical dose forms to make that uh, migration from the regulatory data to the SNOMED concepts easier um, for that particular attribute. Um, similarly, for units of measure and units of presentation, you need to make sure you've got your attributes in place, you understand the mappings from your regulatory data to the SNOMED concepts as a first step. Once you have that in place, <laughs> and just a final note, we do have a free mapping tool called Snap to SNOMED that's available at snap.snomedtools.org. It's a collaborative tool that helps you develop and maintain maps to SNOMED CT. So this is a perfect use case for that tool uh, if you want to map your uh, regulatory attributes to SNOMED. So once you have that in place, we can start off defining our real clinical drug at the bottom. So here's an example of our Zocor uh, Simvastatin 40 milligram film coated tablet from Organon Pharma. And this is our real clinical drug. We have all of those attributes from the international model and all of the attributes that Julie described in the extension model. So we've got precise active ingredients. We've got counts of the base active ingredient. We have the supplier, the product name, and all of that is there. As I said, if we're um, in luck, then we classify this with the model and we find that it nicely classifies under a clinical drug and under a real medicinal product and we're done. But if a clinical drug hasn't been created for this product or a real medicinal product hasn't been created, we may need to take this definition and then copy it. This might be automated or it might be manual, but basically copy the specific definition and abstract up. We remove those attributes that aren't relevant to the real medicinal products. So we remove the strengths, we remove the manufactured dose forms, and we're left with just the count of the base active ingredient and the supplier and the product name. And that gives us the definition of the real medicinal product. And then we do the same thing on the other side. We check whether the clinical drug uh, exists, whether our real clinical drug subsumes nicely underneath it, but in this case, because the clinical drug class uh, is part of the international model, we do first need to check if the clinical drug is in scope of the international model, then we should check the most recent version of the SNOMED International Edition through the daily build. Uh, that's at dailybuild.ihsgestiochills.org. And if the clinical drug we're after does not appear in the daily build, then we can, through the national NRC, request a new clinical drug via the CRS system. And when you do, please provide the regulatory data through the summary of product characteristics or other um, authoritative information to define that drug that you're requesting. Uh, here's a link to SNOMED International's content request system, snomed.org slash CRSUG. That's for the user guide, which has a, a link to the tool. If, however, your clinical drug falls outside the scope of the international edition, and we talked about that briefly earlier, then you may need to create the clinical drug in your own national extension. And then, then that's a case of copying either manually or automated the real clinical drug, removing the supplier and product name to get the clinical drug, you're kind of abstracting up. Uh, and following that process up the hierarchy. You may or may not need a precise medicinal product. We don't in this case. So we're gonna now copy uh, the clinical drug up to the medicinal product form only. Uh, the film coated tablet, we're gonna abstract that up just to an oral tablet. We're going to remove the strength and then be left with just the properties of the 
medicinal product form, which is the precise active ingredient, the manufactured dose form and the counts. And similarly work up the hierarchy to remove the counts to get to the open world classes for the containing. And we do that again on the other side for the medicinal product only. We remove the, uh, the dose form and leave with the count and the active ingredient. And we're up to the top of the hierarchy. So some or all of those steps may or may not be required depending on when you classify whether those concepts have already been created. And then we do the same thing on the other side. We start with our source of truth, the regulatory information. We have the real package drug, and then we uh, classify it and see whether the package clinical drug exists. So I'll just step through that example. Here we have our real package drug, the Zocor 40 milligrams in a 28 tablet pack. And notice in the definition that we've got the contains clinical drug and there's this contains relationship to the real clinical drug. So our pack contains a specific real clinical drug, which was the one that we created before in step one. And once again, once we create this package with the clinical drug, we classify it, we see whether the package clinical drug above it exists. If it does, happy days. If it doesn't, then we copy, we remove the attributes. Uh, and this time, rather than containing the real clinical drug, the package clinical drug contains a unbranded clinical drug. So that's the switch that you need to do at that level. So all of that works really well, as long as the classification works. But you need to be aware of how the classification works in relation to your own national editorial policies and guidelines, as Julie was talking about. So the content in the National Drug Extension depends on the international edition, as we've said, and therefore these subsumptions and equivalences are determined by the modelling of uh, the new concepts. So in your local requirements, you may have requirements to define your strengths using different units of measure, using different bases of strength substances or other local uh, editorial policies that may impact the subsumption when you go to build the hierarchy like I showed you before. So I'll just show you some examples. Oh my goodness, the clicker is disintegrating. <laughs> Um, so here's one example. It's a fairly common use case where a country may use a different basis of strength substance to what was used in the international model. So in the international model, we have a calcium carbonate 1.25 gram chewable tablet as a clinical drug. And then in your national dictionary, you may create a Dupamar calcium 500 milligram chewable tablet and decide that the uh, basis of strength substance, which is the second attribute in the role group. It's calcium carbonate over here, and the base of strength substance is calcium over there. And when you go to create that real clinical drug, you find it doesn't subsume under the clinical drug that you're expecting, even though 500 milligrams of calcium is equivalent to even though there, there are 500 milligrams of calcium in calcium carbonate, 1.25 grams. Here's another example where you may want to use different units of measure in your national editorial rules. So at the international level, we might have calcium carbonate, 1.25 milligram chewable tablet. And in your national drug dictionary, you want to create a Calcimax 1,250 milligram chewable tablet. Once again, it doesn't subsume in the way that you'd expect. And one last example, I think, um, different rounding rules. This is something that we've been talking about in the Drug Extension User Support Group. Um, at the international level, they might choose to round in this way um, with the 3,333.333 units per mil. And in your national extension, you may choose 3,000 units per mil solution for injection. Once again, it doesn't subsume. 
So it's really important to understand this issue and understand that your national editorial guidelines need to work in together with the international rules. Oh, and I have one more example. Iodine 370 milligrams per litre gastroenteral solution versus gastrogriffin 37%. In this case, the iodine is broken up into the individual ingredients. Um, I'm not going to read that. Um, this is a case that we've been discussing recently in the drug user group. Once again, it doesn't subsume as you'd expect. So what's some tips and tricks for classifying drugs? It's really important in your national extension to, in addition to your own national editorial rules, you must include at least one axiom that follows the international editorial policies in order to ensure that that assumption, that subsumption works properly. So you can use two axioms, if you like, one that uses the national rules, but you must have the one that uses the international editorial policies in order for that subsumption to uh, be performed correctly. You can add extension synonyms and even use them as the preferred term in your country. Uh, and they can follow whichever of the editorial policies you've chosen for your national extension. So this is a really tiny example, but if you could just all trust me, um, there's two axioms and the one at the top follows the national drug extension editorial policies and the one at the bottom follows the international editorial rules. And what this means is that when you have these two axioms that are both defined as equivalent uh, to your concept, you will find that you are able to get the correct subsumption. But you still have your national editorial policy, which allows you to query your drug dictionary using your own units of measure and your own base of strength substance as you like. So. <laughs> and now we're going to skip through the quiz. You just. <laughs> I did expect, because this is a tutorial, you to be sort of having desks and a pencil and paper. And you could, I had three examples of um, one reasonably easy, one a little more challenging, and one real beast. But um, you, you've got out of that because we haven't got pencil and paper and we haven't got time to do that. Uh, very happy to to do it at another time in it or another uh, another way. The green click button is literally saturated. Yeah, the, 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 the green sticker is no longer there. Okay, so now we have so we just have just created a new extension, new drug extension. We need to package and release it in some way. There are different patterns in which you can package your extension. It obviously is part of Snowman, so it follows all the rules of any Snowman extension. And different countries have decided different models because depending on, on the on the requirement. But for, there are national extensions who have their national drug extension first, and then their clinical national extension depends on the on the national drug extension. Yes, that, that because maybe they are they want to use in their findings or in their procedures some concepts, some products or substances that they define in the national drug extension. So this is the dependency structure. And some countries have their national extension and they create the substances there. And then they have a, the, the drug extension with only the products and they don't use the products in the procedure. So the products depend on the national extension. So this is a bit of a dependency management. And some countries have decided to create their national extension and the clinical drug extensions on the same model as, as part of the same extension. So depending on your, uh, on your requirements, you may decide to one of these, but basically you will package this as any extension of Snowman City, and you may have addition packages that hide this complexity from the user. Yes, usually you don't release the extension only, so the user needs to build everything. So you try to give them a whole edition where all the dependencies are already resolved, but you need to make this decision at some point in, to, to decide how you will represent this. Separating national drug extensions and national extensions allows you to have a different schedule for the releases. Yes, sometimes you want to release more often the drug extension and less often the clinical extension because it comes from, from the regulatory databases that are updated, updated really frequently. The packages are just normal packages with all the files, RF2, there's a guide for the release file specification. 
So it will look just like that. Some countries also release an alternative representation of the dictionary. So they say, okay, I, my main representation is in SNOMED, but then I can extract like an XML file or plain text uh, table, something that facilitates adoption to systems that don't have SNOMED city embedded. And then when you have those packages, you have two options, the users. I want to use the SNOMED extension you created. You can either have a terminology server or you can have a database. There are open source options for the database and the terminology server, and there are commercial options for terminology server also, which we'll show you. So in theory, in general, we advise people to use these dictionaries using the terminology server, because this opens a lot of possibilities for you for querying, for, for, for refreshing information. We will see that. So it's easier to load the files. You have, you support ECL, the search algorithms and terminology servers are much more advanced. In general, it's much better. Yes, it supports Fire and Fire API, which is very convenient to, to, if you want to switch. So the terminology server sits between the clinical software uh, and the user, and it also is used by analytic software. This page, this snome.org slash stem server has a, a, like a list of requirements and a list of options for terminology servers that includes the Snowstorm, which is the open source one from Snowman International, but there are also missions to other terminology servers like Onto Server and the rest are all included in this page. And once you have a term terminology server, you can start to do queries. These classes that we have been describing all, in all this presentation are available for you to work with them. So if, if you are implementing a user interface that wants to use the, the, the National Drug Dictionary, you can start to see which classes will I use to bind to different fields. So for example, for the if you have a new medication, like a prescription screen, this is like a mock-up is of course very simple i say if I, I choose it let's say in my country i want to do prescriptions using generic drugs i don't want to prescribe brands i want to prescribe like a clinical drug and then the patient will go and buy any brand in the pharmacy so you can say okay i can restrict this field to search only clinical drugs and the doctor will see something like this regardless of the packaging and regardless of the brand and the doctor can decide the dosage and they can decide the frequency. And if you are working in a pharmacy and you receive packages from the trucks that unload all the new medications and you need to add those medications to the pharmacy stock, maybe you need to look for packages and you use the real packaged clinical drugs, yes. And if you are creating, um, if you are dispensing, if you are in, 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 the, in the counter of the pharmacy and you have a prescription and you want to provide a, a, a pack, you, maybe you need to understand the clinical drug and then to get the real package of the clinical drugs. And if you are a knowledge builder and you're creating knowledge bases for allergies, maybe you want to create interactions between these medicinal products and some groupers like estatin containing product, and then you have information about this interaction, for example. And for doing that, we use ECL. Yes, all the classes that Linda described, you can create ECL expressions that identify these classes. For example, any medicinal product that doesn't have a count of basic active ingredient, that doesn't have the zero, zero is not, yes, it's, it's, it's cardinality of zero, doesn't have a manufactured old form and doesn't have a product name, then it's just a grouper or a medicinal product. But if we change the doesn't have for needs to have medicine manufactured dose form, then we are talking about an MPF. And if we change the count of base active ingredient to needs to have, then it's an MPO. So doing this, we can create expressions for each one of the classes. For example, the clinical drugs are medicinal products that have a basis of a strange substance and don't have a product name, because if they will have a product name, they are clinical drugs. So what, what you do with that, there. the same for the real ones. There's an option that you can, this is based on the attributes. So if you have a well-defined strong uh, extension, 
you may use the attributes and that's the best way. But if you have created the content in the extension and it's still primitive and you have not yet added all the possible attributes, you could filter by term. You can say if it has a semantic tag, clinical drug, then it's a clinical drug. And this is like a hack or a shortcut that you will work around and you can do if you don't have the right properties. And these filters by term is a new feature in the newest version of uh, of the, the the ECL, and you can also use the fire expansions filter. If you're using the fire API, each time you expand a value set, you can provide the ECL, and you can also provide a filter, and that's also a way of identifying the different classes. So, like we were saying before, we will use the clinical drugs ECL for this field, and it's also possible also to extract this. Yes, in the case it's a presentation strain, the, the unit of, of delivery, using this, you can say atenolol dot has presentation strain denominator unit. And using this is a way of expressing dosing. Yes, because uh, and you can use ECL also to extract this information. The same for real package clinical drugs. Here you can use the hierarchy to identify which are the real clinical drugs that can be prescribed for this clinical drug, this abstract clinical drug, and then we can use the relationship from the packages to the real clinical drugs to identify which packages contain the clinical drugs that are available for this prescription. So this transformation between the prescription and the, the real things that they can give to the patient can be done also using ECL, yes? And here as well, this is really useful because you can, all the, 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 the clinical drugs, the real clinical drugs and the clinical drugs are descendants of these groupers. So if I'm creating a knowledge base, I can create the knowledge content at different levels. I can say these two families interact with each other or this drug with this family or this drug in this form with this other drug in this form. I can go down in the detail and be more specific or this, this drug in this dosage. So uh, using, creating knowledge bases like this is a, usually requires to use different levels of representation. And then you can pre prepare your, your ECLs in order to identify what's the, what are the possibilities in each one of these fields, for example. We have a page that we will, will not have time to show, I think, right? Come only 10 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Also, also we don't, I don't have a mouse. That's also the this page snowman.org slash drug classes is exemplifies how you access the classes using ECL. You can change in which edition you're looking at, and you can search for any class and you can see the bindings, you can download all the terminology bindings. So it's like a working example of all this. And then let's do the final comment on interoperability between extensions. Yes. We are creating concepts independently in extensions. And then we want also to be able to interoperate with each other in transnational use cases. So there are some considerations about how you can resolve be having created a concept that no one else knows, yes? So in this case, we have two drug extensions, probably. Yes, I said that dictionary, but there are two drug extensions. They have created these concepts. and how to share information between these, because this will have one ID and this will have one ID. And even if the meaning is similar, there is no information to, in the ID to understand that it's similar. And the, this dictionary or this extension doesn't know the other. So you can share the concept ID and the key there is you can share more than one concept ID maybe, or you can share an expression, a post coordinate expression that expresses the full meaning. Um, sorry, go back. A fire, which is the usual, is, is a, currently the most used way of sharing information between system. Fire allows you to, in a value callable concept, in a coding, you can share more than one ID for the same idea, for the same clinical meaning. Yes, you can send, for example, a SNOMED ID and an ICD-10 ID. And in this case, you can share IDs from different editions that represent the same meaning or almost the same meaning. So for you, you can say, that the international edition may have cough, but the Belgium edition may have acute cough, or you may have a, an expression 
that has the same meaning as acute cause. And all these things more mean more or less the same. This is more general, but these two mean the same. And these are the best representations on each one of these schemes for the meaning that I'm trying to, to, to convey. So for example, let's say I need to interoperate between these two national editions with Plenacor 50 and Tenormin 50, yes? So these are the same, but because you don't know what the other has, you can look up in the hierarchy and try to find, find which is the product that is the best representation or the, that I can do for this if, if they don't have my national edition, if they have the international edition. So you say the closest ancestor, the common proximal ancestor in the international edition is a 10 or 50 milligram tablet for this. And for this is a 10 or 50 milligram tablet. So this is the common ancestor. And this is something that you can share with anyone that doesn't have access to, to your national edition and ancestor. In some cases, you have created the clinical drug and in your uh, extension. So in this case, you cannot share the clinical drug because it's still your national edition. You need to share one step both and you need to go to bromazepam only product in oral dose form. Yes, and this is the level in which you can do interoperability. You are losing some information, but this is the best thing you can do if you don't want to share the whole expression because that's of course, if you find this, probably you, you say, maybe I should submit it to international edition. So the next time I can share a more precise thing. But you can also share the model. All the diagrams that we have been explaining also can be represented using this, this, like the, the syntax. Yes, this is a composition syntax. And here, if you share this, you're sharing almost the full meaning. But what you need to do before sharing is to remove references to other concepts in your national extension. So probably you replace those with ancestral concepts, yes? And you probably set the, the concept to primitive, and then you can share this meaning. And when, when you share that meaning from here, this is one extension that has this meaning, and you put that meaning in an, another terminology and you classify like a post-coordinated expression, you do an incremental classification, you can ask the terminology server, the classifier, what, what, what's the parent of this meaning? Is it equivalent to something? Do, what's the parent? How is it located into the hierarchy? So communicating the whole expression probably is the best way to interpret between dictionaries, but it requires uh, advanced features in the terminology server that are just appearing. The, the, the APIs to be able to insert a post coordinating expression that the expression is classified and then to query that expression to see where it lies into the, the ontology in the destination extension. So this is like the, the, the goal to where we are all going. So if you want to learn more about the, the, the medicinal model, we, we have the NPM, this is a slash, slash NPM, medicinal product model specification. The NDEM is a national drug extension model. We have the editorial guide that covers also medications. We have the drug extension user group that we meet often uh, once a month, and we have presentations, recording of previous presentations, experiences by members. And then we have some tools like the browser, the MRCM in the browser that will describe all the attributes with more detail and the ranges and everything. Map to SNOMED, which is the mapping tool. And then we have the educational courses that also cover creating things. So you would see the, the of course, you have the implementation course and the outsourcing course and, and some documentation related to that. So you can check that. So thank you very much. We are just in time for a few questions. Thanks very much, everyone. We have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, Julie's answering one online. Does anyone, uh, here live, have any questions? Yes. Hi, sorry, there was um, one of the attributes for, I can't remember which, which section of the hierarchy included essentially what the drugs are used for, right? Like what the actual clinical effect of prescribing it might be. Is there anywhere where side effects are there as well? Is it included in the same place, but just as a, no. a different phrasing? It, it, that's a therapeutic grouper, the one you say. 
And no, side effects is something that is not definitional for the drug. Therapeutic use of neither. That's why it's, it's using a different axiom. But SNOMED always tries to contain definitional information and not knowledge information. There is no information on maximum doses, interactions, or, or adverse effects. But there are very good companies that provide you that information already mapped to SNOMED as a service. And they work on updating that. So if you have your content represented with the SNOMED, it's really easy to connect to those knowledge bases and, and use the information provided by them. Are there any other questions? Well, in that case, we might conclude the session. Thanks very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day.